To answer the burning question, is the Great Barrier Reef still great, we should break it down into digestible chunks. How's the coral? Are there fish? Are the fish still making baby fish? How about the top predators? Is it sharky? Are there still dirty fish and cleaners to clean them? Is there small stuff? Are there any cutes left? What about cool random stuff? And are there any divers? I'll answer each of these questions with brand new footage as I filmed it in October 2023. To find the answers, I joined the crew and guests on Kalinda on her far north expedition. Over nine days, we sampled nearly 300 nautical miles of the Great Barrier Reef's most remote sites, pretty much the top third of the GBR. We briefly covered a couple of the well-known ribbon reefs north of Cairns before hitting the far north reefs as we worked our way to the northern tip of Australia. On the way, we hit some amazing reefs, drifted down walls, explored some lagoons, and some cracking pinnacle dives, or bommies as we call them down here. I'll run through our area of operations and a brief trip summary to show the extent and limits of this glimpse at the GBR. And I'll break down each of the questions posed earlier. Loosely, corals, fish, small critters, sharks, and of course, cukes and divers. We started our diving at Ribbon Reef 3 and finished day one at Ribbon 10, the beautiful Pixie's Pinnacle. Day two was rough and shitty, but my old favorite lighthouse bommie was better than I remembered it. We finished the second day at the world famous Cod Hole, which was way up there on the shittiness scale. 22 years ago, it was incredible. 12 years ago, it got smashed by a cyclone, but still had some nice bits and big potato cod. On this trip, we saw neither. The reef was recovering with soft corals and some hard corals, but the fish have not come back yet. But that's most of the bad news out of the way. We hid behind Lizard Island during some funky weather on day three and squeezed in some less than stunning dives. These reefs are inshore with not great water clarity or coral health, but it was better than I expected and surprisingly fishy. This was the launch point for our biggest crossing up to the far north proper. Day four, we hit the stunning reefs north of the 14th parallel. Most of these reefs don't even have names. Instead, the authorities number them. We dived 14034, which is the 34th reef south of the 14th parallel. And then we continued our way north and the diving turned awesome. There were some pretty poor reefs that we had to survey, but the diving got steadily better as we went. Tiju Reef, Mantis and Wishbone, then wood and the legendary Great Detached Reef. So let's start with the coral. Researchers are interested in three things, coral cover, coral health, and coral diversity. I was worried about the ribbon reefs, but I need not have. By all three measures, the corals were scoring well. I started my underwater filming career on these very reefs over 20 years ago, and I've visited not quite regularly since. We didn't get to do many of my old favourites, but Lighthouse Bombing was as good as I've seen it. Windy weather and some coral survey commitments had us exploring some reefs we wouldn't otherwise have visited, and predictably those reefs were a bit on the shitty side. As our expedition continued north to rarely dived areas, the health of the reefs we visited was outstanding. Some areas boasted near 100% coral cover. The diversity was great too. One thing I hoped not to see, especially on those remote reefs, was bleaching or any signs of it. Coral bleaching 101. We've all heard the headlines and probably know the usual outcome is the widespread death of coral. But as a diver witnessing this slowish process, it's probably not what you think. I've dived hundreds of reefs that have had corals bleach and die. Their skeletons last for decades. But a couple of times I've witnessed and filmed the process. I don't have before and after shots, but I have these during shots. Coral reefs in the process of bleaching is remarkable. The mechanics are simple if not well understood, but most importantly the microscopic plant-like animals called zooxanthellae, which give corals most of their energy and brownish colour, leave their coral host, which makes the corals look almost Wes Anderson colourful. The coral scientists call it fluorescence, which describes the phenomena pretty well. The dying corals are unusually colourful and extend their tentacles, even during the day, to try and catch some prey to replace the food the zooxanthellae would normally have supplied. If these stressed corals can re-inoculate with better adapted zooxanthellae before they starve, they'll recover. If not, they die and become habitat for other corals and critters to live on and under. It's sad to think these juvenile humbugs are about to lose their home to bleaching. So this is what it looks like. These corals may bleach or not, but I hate to say I'm not hopeful for them. What about fish? Well, there are plenty and 
good diversity and fair numbers I'd say. Small fish were making baby fish, the spiny chromis were even tending their young'uns, one of the very few species that actually bothers with parental care. The large predators like groupers or coral trout as we call them down here are in pretty good numbers. There are plenty of cleaning stations full of diverse cleaners which always attract customers. What about sharks? Well reefs like this are supposed to be very sharky and drifting alone in the blue should get you buzzed by grey reef and silver tip sharks of a decent size. I'm sad to say I didn't see any big silver tips. Small ones on most dives, but the big ones were notably absent. A few decent sized grey reefies and pretty good sized white tip reef sharks were common and nice to see. And as it was mating season, they were pretty friendly. I wasn't especially focused on small stuff, but there were pretty good numbers of nudibranchs and flatworms, plenty of small fish, and encouragingly, excellent numbers and diversity of sea cucumbers. We also were treated to cuttlefish, octopus, and plenty of beautiful underwater scenery. The diving was very good overall, and a great time was had by all. So is the Great Barrier Reef still great in 2023? I'd have to say yes, but don't wait too long. It looks to me like the climate crisis is going to hit hard in the coming months and years. I hope I'm wrong, but if you're thinking about diving the GBR in your lifetime, I'd be booking now and crossing fingers that it still rocks when you get here. I'm Josh from Undersea Productions, thanks for watching. Thank you.